God is and has always been faithful. He's faithful to his word, to his people. He's faithful to his church. He is faithful. And when I started to think about that word, I, I, I had to go to the dictionary and I had to say, like, what does the word even mean, really? I think it's clear sometimes that we can throw all these words and maybe we don't really know what they really mean. And so, like, to look at it, like, the dictionary defines it as being loyal, constant, steadfast. Another definition is he is true to the facts. Doesn't change and he won't. And that, my friends, is some good news. Amen? See, God is faithful in every generation. I believe that. He has and he will be faithful. And what he doesn't do in us, he will do in the next. And that gives me hope. That gives me hope. Because I can look back and I can see maybe things that maybe my mom's generation or my grandfather's generation were called to do and maybe they just didn't step up. Maybe they didn't step into it and they didn't do it. But it doesn't mean that God is not going to be faithful to what he said he was going to do and accomplish. And you can go back and you can read the stories even in God's word of, of people he called to do something and they're like, yeah, I'm good. But yeah, it, his word is faithful. It comes to be true, like he is faithful. You can read of the stories where maybe one of God's, you know, a group of people that God called and, and chose to do something, they were disobedient, but his plan still took place. It may not have looked like the full original plan, but his word and his plan stayed the course. Because God is, and he was, faithful. From the very beginning, he's been faithful to what he has said he will do. So why do we sometimes get caught up in the mindset that he has forgotten us or left us behind? Why do we sometimes get caught up in this mindset of like, God, where are you? Why have you left me behind? I see all these things going on in our world around us. It'd be a really good time for you to show up. I don't know about you, but there's been moments in life recently where I've thought to myself of like, you know, Jesus, you said you're coming back. Tomorrow at 1230 would be a really good time. 1231 would work too. You can be a little bit late, not a big deal. But tomorrow's a good day to come back. The world kind of is in shambles. Things are kind of going, you know, downhill really quickly. Tomorrow's a good day for you to return. Let's just end it. Let me just be with you. Sound, so, anybody else ever have that prayer? Be like, yo, God, <laughs> amen. Come on, you can raise those hands high. Like, we get it, right? Like, God, tomorrow's a good day. Where are you? Where are you? And I love that, that Paul actually doesn't shy away from some of the hard topics sometimes. I love that Paul even kind of talks about some of these things. He would be writing to these churches and he'd see things going on in the churches that were not godly, but yet he doesn't shy away from addressing them. I wonder how many times that maybe even Paul was like, Jesus, did you really have to leave already? Like there came a moment, I think, where he kind of looks at some of this stuff and he's like, what is happening in, in, in 1 Corinthians, like, Paul writes to the church in Corinth about some lessons that we can learn from Israel's past. I think this is important for us, too. Paul is writing to the church saying, do you remember what happened? Like, there is a whole history of things that have happened. Do you remember what has happened? He reminds them of the times of being delivered from Egypt. You remember when you were slaves? Remember when you were whipped and you had to do certain things Got and the oppression that you faced? Do you remember those times? Your ancestors were there. Do you remember? Have you forgotten those times? You see, God was faithful to deliver them out of that, but then they turned from him and what did they do? They worshiped idols. They worshiped these things that they made out of gold afterwards. They turned from him. It wasn't even long after they were delivered, these same people who walked out of Egypt, 
then make idols and they start worshiping them. Like these idols made out of gold were the things that delivered them out of Egypt and the oppression and the slavery. And yet Paul is reminding them, like, remember, they even didn't get it. Paul reminds them that they can learn from it. And God delivered them, and he will and deliver you too. And even in the things that you face right now, God's present. In 1 Corinthians 10, this is uh, verse 13. This is what it reads. <clears throat> the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. I think this, this scripture is very interesting to me. Read it, read it again. Temptations in your life are no different than the, from what others experience. Anybody ever feel like they've, they're going through something that nobody else can relate to? But then the next sentence, God is faithful. Intriguing placement, Paul. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. Not only is God faithful, but he's powerful. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. We're going to talk more about that, but I also want to read this from um, one of my personal favorite translations real quick, uh, the Passion Translations. This is what it says. So this is like a, mo hang on, before I read that, sorry. This is like a modern version of some of the scripture. This is like a, a and I hate saying modern version. This is, this is more like a, a spirit-infused type of thing which brings more feeling into it. And so there's some, there's some people who don't like this translation. They think it's way too modern and it loses some of the, the power of the original um, you know, Greek. But I, I love it because I think I can relate sometimes to it. And so this is what it says. Uh, we all experience times of testing, which is normal for every human being. But God will be faithful to you. He will not screen and filter, or he will screen and filter the severity, the nature, and the timing of every test or trial you face so that you can bear it. And each test is an opportunity to trust him more. For along with every trial, God has provided for you a way of escape that will bring you out of it victoriously. I love that. I love that. See, others have gone before us and they've faced the temptations that we are facing and they have found strength in him and his faithfulness. Others have been here. Others have walked through this. And God promises to be with us even in the midst of temptations and struggles. He's faithful. He says he will be there with us even in the midst of of temptation, even in the midst of struggles. We are capable to resist the temptation, capable in him, but not in ourselves. How often do we go through something and we're sitting there and we try to overcome it and we're like, God, like, what are you doing? But we're trying to overcome it in my own strength. I can go to the gym as many times as I want. I can do as, get and read as many self-help books as I want. But until I rely on, rely on God, I will not be able to resist the temptation and overcome. Because my hope and my power has to come from the Lord, amen? amen. It can't come from myself. It, can't, it doesn't matter how many times I bench press 350 pounds. I can't do that right now. My hope and my strength has to come from the Lord. It doesn't matter what I, 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 I try to do on my own. God is one who will provide. He provides a way out in the midst of temptation. And I love this. I love this. That God provides a way out in the midst of temptation. And, and, and in one of the footnotes of, of, of the uh, tra Passion Translation, it says that the trust in God's faithfulness is the way of escape that empowers us to overcome every difficulty we may experience. We are not told that every difficulty will be removed from our lives, but that God's grace provides an exit path. 
what I find interesting about this is he says there will be a way out, right? And it might not be relief from it, though. If you go back and look at the scripture again, can you throw that back up there real quick? He will show you a way out that you can endure, right? It doesn't say you will be relieved from it. I want to make this as clear, right? It doesn't say relief. Because I think that relief from it, we can get relief when we try to do it on our own and we give into it. If I give into temptation, I feel relief from it, right? You almost feel like this weight has been lifted. You're like, ha, huh, okay, I don't got to deal with that anymore. But when you have to endure it, when you have to push through it, when you have to go through it, the test and the trial, as you are going through the test and the trial, it's uncomfortable. It's not fun. It doesn't provide relief. But you do have a way out. It'd be closer, getting relief would be closer to surrendering to it and not overcoming it. And I think it's interesting that Paul says there's a way out so that you can endure it, not get relief from it. It's almost like a mountain pass. God will provide a mountain pass. It's not an easy way out, but it's an easy way out. And when we surrender, we're faced with the same temptations until we overcome in his name. But if you ever walked or drove through a mountain pass, you can remember and you can understand that sometimes it's a little scary. Sometimes you can't see what's around the next curve. On our honeymoon, we went to Tennessee and we were driving in some of the mountains and um, I remember driving and there are these signs that say like blind curve ahead. And I'm like, that's stupid. I don't get what it means. And then the curve came and I'm like, I understand what it means. You can't see what's about to happen. And, and you're driving and it says like, you know those signs that you see all over the, the roads and stuff? And it says like speed limit, what, those recommendations of how fast you should go. <laughs> They're like suggestions really, right? But like those recommendations, they were up on the mountain pass as well. Like they suggest you go 25. Kyle thought, <laughs> 25, we'll see how fast I really can take this curve. There's all these things that like, as I'm driving through this mountain pass and we're weaving back and forth and there, I'm looking at these signs and Corey's like, are you going to pay attention to that one? Nope. And we just keep going and blind curve ahead and you're like, okay, maybe I'll slow down. And you look and then you make the turn and, and there's another car coming. You see, I think sometimes our life as we go through struggles it's like that mountain pass. I might not see what's coming around the curve. That next curve might be a breakthrough. It might be like the heavens have opened up and I can see everything as far as the eye can see. But that next curve also might mean more trees, more darkness, more uncertainty. But I'm still called to walk and to go with him at his pace, to pay attention. It's more like a mountain pass than a relief. In the way of escape, he doesn't say that, you know, when, when he provides a way of escape, you'll, you'll be able to endure it. He says that, yes, but he doesn't say you will never go through it again. A way of escape doesn't mean we won't face it again. But rather, it's a place where we can now bear it. We can understand it. And as I reflect back, I wonder how many times God provided a way of escape for me to endure stuff. But yet when it happens again, I look at it and I forget that he's provided before. I forget that God has sustained me and he's been faithful already to me. I forget of what he's done. See, God uses Paul to remind the people in, in the church in Corinth that he was faithful and even now he is with them and he will be faithful to deliver them from the things that they are struggling, is, is struggling with. And this promise is true for us today. No matter what we might be going through, no matter where we may be traveling right now, God's faithful. He can and he will deliver you. 
He will restore you. He can redeem you, renew you, and heal you in his name. But in order to do that, we have to, we have to go with him through the mountain pass. We have to trust him in the blind curves. We have to trust him as we are going up higher and higher. We have to trust him even when, when it might feel like it's hard to breathe and the air is getting thinner and thinner as you go up higher into the mountains. You have to trust him even in those moments. He's got you. He's been faithful before. He will be faithful again. And what blows me away is that there's, there's people that God called to do certain stuff and they've been faithful to his word. They've been faithful to their call. They've been faithful to exactly what they laid on his heart. Not only is God faithful, but we see that people of God can and are faithful as well. There are those others who run from the call, yes, but there's others who when God calls them to something, they step up and they say, here I am, let's go. Moses was called to do an incredible act but he never got to see the promised land. Ooh. That's tough, man. Like here he is and he's, he, he had some excuses for God in the beginning, right? But then he does what God calls him to do. He leads the people out of Egypt and he walks with them through the sea and he sees all these Egyptians get wiped away by the water. That'd be really cool to watch, by the way. And then he stands there and he walks with them in the desert, but guess what? He never sees it. He never sees the promise. He was faithful. He did everything he was called to do, y'all. And he never sees the promise. But he had to trust in God in the midst of the desert and not seeing the payoff in the end. And I think we live in a time where we don't understand this and we don't value it. I think we live in a time where we maybe just glaze over this. Because I think we live in a society that would rather have 30 minutes of fame over 30 years of faithfulness. I will, I will be the first one to admit in my youth ministry days, this was something that was such a struggle. Such a struggle. I remember early on as I started and I was a volunteer and then an intern, I remember talking to these students and I was like, talking to them, and I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about what God is doing. I'm talking about how he has a plan for them and I believe in it and I'm, I'm walking with them and I'm seeing radical life change of students leaving behind things of, of this world, leaving behind the party and the, the drugs, the sex and the alcohol and, and starting to walk with Jesus. And then they graduate high school and guess what? I never heard from them Again, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, did I make a difference? Like, what, what in the world is happening? What's going on? We'd rather have 30 minutes of fame than 30 years of faithfulness. I learned, what I learned in youth ministry was this, is that um, <laughs> I may never see the payoff of that. I, I may never see the payoff of some of the seeds that I planted in some of these students. But what blows me away is, is I started to serve in youth ministry in 2006. So it's been, what, like 13 years now. Man, I'm old. Um, 13 years ago. And what has blown me away recently is that some of those guys who I started to serve with and serve over, and I was their leader. They're not walking. <laughs> they're, they're walking not only with the Lord, but they're walking in his call of their life to be a youth pastor. There's this one kid, I'm not gonna mention his name. Um, he was in my very first group. And... Uh, he was this young dude, and he was just, he was crazy. He had so much energy. And I remember I'd go through the service, and I'd go through the message, and he would be, you know, that kid who just was so hyped up on everything. He was just so excited to be there. And he knew it. Like, he knew God. He knew the stories and everything, and he's walked with God. 
but I always knew there was something more in him. And, and just this few weeks ago, last week, he, he started classes. He started classes to be a youth pastor. Y'all, it's been 13 years. And I see it, though. But our, our society is so instant gratification. I want my instant fame right now. Give me it now. Forget being faithful for 30 years. Give me the 30 minutes of fame. What blows me away, though, is that Jesus was faithful for 30 years to his calling before he even did ministry. 99 chapters in the Gospels talk about Jesus. 95 of the 99 talk about Jesus' ministry, so 30 years in to 33. Four chapters talk about his obsolete years. Four chapters. Four chapters talk about baby Jesus, boy Jesus. Four chapters lead up to 30. Like, let's just think about that for a hot second. Jesus had to be faithful in those years. We're told that Jesus faced temptation. Which means Jesus faced temptation and he had to be faithful to his call. 30 years of faithfulness. 30 years. Man, what is God calling you to be faithful in and, and walk with him even when you might not see the end of it? He calls us to walk humbly with him. He calls us to seek and to be faithful to his calling and the direction in our lives. Jesus, he calls us to that. What might God be calling you to walk faithfully with him even when you may not see the end right now and even when you may not understand all that he is doing and about to do in your life? What might he be calling you to continue to walk faithfully in or to start to walk faithfully in even when you don't see the end? In, in some previous messages, I spoke about how I truly love kind of like that last week of Jesus' life. I love the last week and learning about it and diving into it and discovering all that happened in those last few days and hours of Christ's life. I believe that Jesus displays such a powerful example of his faithfulness, even in the midst of hardship when he speaks to his disciples before everything goes down. I think Jesus displays an incredible example of faithfulness to the call that he had on his life, even in the midst of knowing what's about to happen in the next few hours. In John 16, 31 through 33, this is what um, I'm referencing. He asks, do you finally believe the time is coming? Indeed, it's here now. When you will be scattered, he's talking to his disciples, each one going his own way, leaving me alone, Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Take heart, because I have overcome the world. I find this scripture interesting as well. I think Jesus is a wordsmith. I think he's brilliant. See, he's talking with his disciples about what is about to happen. And here he offers hope. He offers peace. But notice he doesn't promise it. He offers it. He offers hope. He offers peace. But he doesn't promise it. He calls them to a deeper purpose in this. He calls them to a deeper meaning in their lives. And they may not even fully understand it right now. Jesus is calling them to a deeper purpose, a deeper meaning that even his disciples in the midst of everything that is about to go down, they don't understand what he's about to speak into them, what he is about to do and about to unleash upon this earth. Jesus is a deep guy and, and deep calls to a deeper meaning. And I remember when I got here and Josh was going through, he goes, what in the world does that mean, Kyle? I said, I said, 
This is what it means. I said, Jesus, when he talks to his disciples, when he talks to us, sometimes it's not super clear. Maybe I'm the only one who gets the signs mixed up. Maybe I'm also the only one who's driving and is like, yo, Jesus, a bright neon sign that said exit now would be great for me because I will miss the exit because I'm too distracted with everything going around. Like looking at these suggested speed signs that I'm not really paying attention to, I need a bright neon sign to say, Kyle, get off now. And I think Jesus, in a way, is saying, guys, I got something for you. You're about to do something great, but this is not your neon sign. You got to wait a little bit. There's a deeper meaning behind all of it. I think he's calling them to take a risk, to trust his presence and faith, to go out and cast your net. Peter, ooh, Peter is like one of my homies. I feel like, man, like David in the Old Testament, Peter, Paul, like I feel like we would have been like close friends. I think Peter gets me sometimes, you know? <laughs> Peter, like I, I picture Peter sitting and talking with Jesus so often and Jesus says certain stuff and I just picture him like, man, Jesus, you are off your rocker. Like you are, you are out there, bro. But like Peter, right? What goes through his mind in some of these moments? Here's a guy, let's just call it what it is. Here's a young guy who is sitting there who a few years ago was literally sitting in a boat fishing, just fishing, with his dad. And Jesus is walking by the water, and what does he say? Come follow me. Like, Peter's just fishing. And Jesus says, come follow me. And what does, do you remember what, what happens? What does Peter do? It says immediately he goes and follows Jesus. Kyle translation. I'm fishing. I'm throwing my nets overboard. And Jesus says, hey, come follow me. And Peter goes, sounds great. And he like, they're kind of like skirts. And he like pulls it up and ties it around. And he just like, and jumps, and he's in the water, and he's swimming. I don't know if he's a good swimmer. I don't know how far out he is, but he's like Michael Phelps in that thing, and he's just going towards Jesus, and he gets here, and he's dripping wet, and he's like, hey, where are we going, by the way? Like, that's all. Jesus was like, yo, hey, follow me, and he gets to shore, and he's dripping wet, soaking wet, panting for breath. He's probably out of shape, and he's like, where are we about to go? What are we about to do? And Jesus is like, I'm going to make you a great fisherman. You don't even know what that really means yet, but you'll find out. Just come hang out with me. Okay. Do you have a towel? No. Cool. And they walk. Like Peter. Peter. One day, Jesus walks by, yells at him. Next thing you know, he's jumping overboard to follow Jesus. Jesus called Peter to a deeper meaning, a deeper purpose that then got stuck in his heart. And he followed immediately. But even after Jesus dies, and Peter has gone through a lot, right? He walks on water. That's pretty sweet. Again, Jesus calls him to a deeper meaning, calls him out into the deep, I think there's more, more at play in Peter's life than even Peter can imagine. And here he is, and, and Jesus dies, and he rises again. And what happens? Jesus goes to where G Peter is. After he's dead, Jesus shows up at the beach, and what's Peter doing again? Fishing. And he says, throw your nets on the other side. He does. Pulls in all of this fish. All of them. And what does he do again? He's like, I know you. 
So he backs up, pulls up his skirt, ties it around, and jumps in. And Jesus makes him breakfast on the beach. Jesus offers peace to us before his death. Jesus offered peace to his disciples before he even dies. He doesn't promise it. He offers it like he did to his disciples. He did promise one thing in that scripture though. Trials and tribulations. See, we know we're going to encounter trouble, but we also know that he has been faithful to offer us peace in the midst of it. Trials and tribulations. In those days where Jesus is getting sentenced and then ultimately crucified and rose again, Peter rejects Christ, but yet Peter is offered hope and peace after all because Jesus conquers the grave. We too can have peace in the midst of struggles because Christ is faithful to us, his bride, his church. We can have peace. We can have hope because Christ has overcome. And we get peace through victory. Victory in Christ, not of us. That's how we get the peace that he's offered us. For him who is about to be arrested, forsaken, rejected, mocked, tortured, and executed, he says, I have overcome the world. Like, do we understand the radical truth and power of Jesus' words and his faithfulness when he speaks in the midst of everything happening? Here he is, and he's like, y'all don't even get it yet. I'm about to die. People are going to spit on me. They're going to put thorns on me. I'm about to be bloodied. I'm going to be bruised and broken. And yet, I stand here and I say, I have overcome it all. I have overcome the world. I have, there's power in that. The statement that is spoken in the shadow of the cross is ridiculous. Ridiculous. And he goes to the cross not in fear or gloom, but as a conqueror. Like, radical truth of Jesus standing there saying, you can have my peace because I have conquered it all. And this, this device, this cross that the Romans intended for torture and brokenness and all of this pain, almost Jesus embraced and he looks at it and he's like, it's finally here. I get to meet you. I get to carry you. He embraces it as a conqueror, not out of fear, not out of, like he embraces it knowing he has conquered the world. And because he overcame, we too can be overcomers in the world, amen? See, Jesus quenches your thirst for purpose. He's faithful. And he quenches your thirst for purpose. And I'm convinced that once you taste his presence and love, you will never thirst for purpose again. Once you taste his presence and his love, you'll never thirst for purpose again because the purpose he has poured upon you is so much greater than anything this world can offer. Once you've tasted, seen, and experienced all he has and is doing in your life, you'll never thirst for it again because this fountain is greater than anything this world can offer you. So what does that mean for us today? It means that you need to go and walk presently in holy confidence that your future is taken care of. That we get to go and walk confidently knowing that God has overcome the world. And when you walk and you go through hell and back and you feel bro bruised, broken, and hurting, guess what? The wounds are there, but God heals all those things. There's been many times where I remember sitting, thinking like, God, why in the world is this happening? We're gonna dive into this next week, by the way. I have done nothing wrong. Why am I in this situation? I feel bruised, I'm broken, I'm shattered, I'm hurting. I feel like I'm bleeding out. I can't take one more hit. Where are you? And when it feels like I'm literally walking through hell and back, and I am so beat up, 
I ask those questions. I've been there, I've done that. God heals in those moments. He shows up in radical ways. And even when we don't see him or hear him, he's still present. He's still present. Because remember in the shadow of the cross, he walked up to it and he made the ridiculous claim that he is a conqueror. And it's truth. The scars we have are the moments in our lives that Christ has healed us and says, look where and what I've brought you through. Scars. I have many scars in my body. Some of them from being really stupid. Others of them from just normal stuff. Um, I play a lot of softball. And so there's literally an area on, on my calf right here um, that is, is so calloused over that my leg hair doesn't grow on it anymore because um, there are moments where I am stubborn, believe it or not, and I refuse to wear baseball pants sometimes. And so when I slide, it gets all, hey, don't be nudging him. Don't be, uh, uh-uh. I know, Joe, you get me, right? So like there's this moment though like where it gets so beat up and bruised and like tore up that like Courtney hates it. And she's like, you have baseball pants. I'm like, I know, but they're just so hot. She's like, well, then don't play in 92 degree weather. And I said, I, I have to. Who else is going to play? Here I am. Said, no. Um, but so like there's this spot right here. And it's so like I've slid so many times that like it, it's, just, it's just grown to be hardened and, and, and it's, it's crazy to me. And every year, there's always, always, without fail, the one game, and it's usually the first game, where I have to slide. And I slide on it. And I get up and I dust it off and I'm like, oh man, Courtney's gonna be mad again. Hopefully I don't bleed. Because then I have to sleep on the couch. <sighs> Can't get the sheets dirty. Oh man. Um, but I'm reminded over and over again, like, you've been here before and you're gonna make it through. Scars. It reminds us of where we've been and where we're going and what you've been through. Jesus' scars remind us and remind him of what he's gone through. See, Christ's scars show us his love. Our scars show us his grace, his mercy, his love, power, and faithfulness. So walk humbly and confidently knowing that your scars have a purpose. Knowing that he is faithful. And when you feel like things just are out of control and out of your hands and you don't know what's going on, God's got control. He's been faithful to protect his people and he will be faithful. If God can close the lion's mouth for Daniel, part the Red Sea for Moses, make the sun stand still for Joshua, open prison doors for Peter, raise Lazarus from the dead, he can certainly take care of you in your situation. Have faith in, faith in him. No matter what you might be walking through right now, no matter what struggle, burden, baggage you might be carrying right now, he's faithful. He has you. He has it. He's faithful.